I pre prepared some remarks. I don't have any slides. But I think that this is going to pick up on some of the things that we've already been talking about. And I probably have more questions than anything else to offer. So hopefully that will help. Um, but I want to start with my own kind of like background a little bit and thinking about um, about 15 years ago, I had my first job that I've categorized as explicitly linking me to associations of people. And I worked for the American Association for Cancer Research, which was an international membership organization um, that was supporting cancer researchers and finding cures for cancer. And I saw three extraordinary contributions to cancer research during my time there through these associations of people. One was witnessing the team of researchers who came up with the HP HPV vaccine um, received prestigious recognition at an award ceremony, right? It was brand new at this point. And now we see like commercials on TV about this HPV vaccine and it's a routine pediatric vaccine that you can use. Um, another was the emergence of the Stand Up to Cancer program of the Entertainment Industry Foundation. So this is bringing together actors and singers, um, administrative professionals, cancer researchers, and other stakeholders to find cures for cancer. And they began doing this work, again, over a decade ago. Today, they can claim that the power of their association has resulted in over 180 clinical trials that have been planned, started, or completed, over $603 million pledged towards cancer research, and it has engaged and brought together over 1,500 cancer researchers to work on these projects. Another um, one of these kinds of examples of seeing an association of people kind of like come together was around the topic of racial um, cancer health disparities. So back in 20, 2009, uh, no, prior to that, 2006, 2007, the words race and cancer coming together and thinking about health disparities was a really contentious topic. And so this organization was bringing together cancer researchers, um, uh, academics from other fields like sociology, and um, anthropology, looking at um, working with behavioral scientists to imagine what are the implications, right? Is this a biological thing? Is this because, you know, a lot of folks of color don't trust doctors <laughs> because of the historical um, experimentation and treatment that they've received by the medical community? Like, what's happening? And now we can, I think, feel pretty confident looking now that we see and we talk about health disparities as being a real thing that it's not something that is made up, right? And that it's a combination of all of these social and biological factors that, and environmental factors that are playing into these results. And I say this now because now I'm a part of the co-op community. <laughs> and I'm awed when I think about the potential that our associations of people have for addressing societal injustices. And we've already done a lot. And so I want to explore a little bit again, by asking a lot of questions. And the first one is, what is principle six? Oh yeah, I like this choral kind of response. So let's keep that going. Um, and what is principle seven? Okay. And so in a recent um, PACA workshop, one of our co-op development fellows, Niambi Royster, she talked about how principles six and seven, which I'll just said what they were, cooperation amongst cooperatives and concern for a community. What is principle number five? Yes. <laughs> so these three principles are the pillars upon which the other principles in the co-op enterprise model are actually built upon, right? Thinking about the people. And so I come to doing co-op development work with the understanding that the co-op has these two essential components. And they are interdependent, but one is essential to distinguishing the co-op business model from any other business model. And that primary element is the voluntary association of people who come together to be in relationship with one another. And through that relationship, they choose to express their will to fulfill a common need through a democratically owned 
and govern enterprise. And so through this power of the association of people, so much is possible. That association deepens the principles of the co-op movement and how they are practiced within um, the enterprise that they create. It has the opportunity to share those practices that they create with other cooperatives, other associations of people, and other organizations um, that provide economic, cultural, and societal benefit to communities. And right now, the cooperative or the cooperatively organized enterprise model is in great need by many people. And in particular, we're thinking about folks who have traditionally been excluded from mainstream economy, who have suffered at the hands of systemic racism and xenophobia, as well as the unjust and unequal treatment within our criminal justice system. And so we sit together thinking about our hyperlocal communities and the varied associations of people that are represented by the various food co-ops that are here. And I challenge us to think how the projects of our individual co-ops are fulfilling the basic need of food sovereignty among those most vulnerable within and adjacent to our communities. What power and opportunities exist among our co-ops collectively to address the systemic problem of food apartheid? In your city, if your city, town, and or state has multiple co-op businesses, what organizing strategies are being put to use to galvanize the hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of cooperators in these locales? More questions. What statewide food-related policies are food co-ops and their member owners pushing forward? How many of us supported the Healthy Food Financing Initiative as a part of the U.S. Farm Bill? Right? Have we done it in the past? Are we going to do it next year? Are food co-ops represented on local policy um, groups that deal with food access and food security? Have we grounded our food justice work in analyses like, for instance, like the pillars of food sovereignty or the just transition framework that can be guides to help us figure out how do we better serve our communities with a check, right, against the work that we're doing? And what power does the retail environment Beyond the retail environment, I should say, what power does the association of people actually have to make peace? And I also want to think about what are the opportunities that our co-ops and our associations have in partnering with other kinds of organizations that have similar values and practices and principles as cooperatives to particularly think about resolving the food system challenge. We had full abundance here, um, and we got to really see a deep connection to the purpose of the work that we're all trying to do and how that shows up in other ways, and how a community like this really helps to support the like that. Are we in partnership with black and brown-led institutions and community groups that are tackling food apartheid, right? Because a lot of our food co-ops are located in those communities and or adjacent to those communities? And what work are we doing to educate and share information about the food system and food production process, the conditions of workers in the um, food system, the environmental harm our food system produces? Are we joining coalitions, partnering with organizations, bringing them in to educate our co-op member owners? There's a lot of principles things happening, right? I can lift up the work that the food co-ops in the Philadelphia region have been doing over the last four years. And they've been making loans to each other, giving donations, providing staff, borrowing staff and sharing staff, giving advice, sharing policies, and more to coordinate and offer a shared uh, container for all co-ops to do well together. A most recent example, because Mariposa Food Co-op didn't say this, and this is something they should definitely be proud of, <laughs> is that they just provided a $10,000 donation to South Philly Food Co-op towards their capital plan. They also provided $10,000 donation to PECA in support of anti-racism and anti-oppression training. Okay. And so 
these are some of the examples and the ways in which we can do this work to support each other. But there are many more questions. And all of you now have the opportunity to reflect on the ones that are provided to you and some of these that I've, I've pointed out. And I'm going to ask you not to think of your co-op business as the sole output of your association of people. I ask you to dream about what your association of people can do with other associations of people and co-ops and other organizations to drive transformation to not meet one need, but to grow the co-op economy, movement, and cooperative ways of being by finding new pathways for your association of people to expand into enterprise. Participation is a challenge. Who and what is limiting the participation opportunities of our associations of people to the one enterprise that they've already got? That's going down the path. But I think it's something that we have room to explore. So as you enter this next set of interaction together, I trust that you will find meaningful ways to explore the deep and valuable relationships with other co-ops and organizations that are available to you. And I hope that you'll be thinking about the associations of people and how they can be organized. What are their other collective challenges besides food? And what can we learn to do together cooperatively to transform our world? This is why we're doing all of this hard work, right? Okay, that's it. Thank you.